Hello everybody, I hope you're having a great day today. Uh, it's Mr. Ray with your next calculus lesson. We're going to continue on with our introduction to calculus unit. Uh, we're going to look a little more in depth into the properties of limits. Uh, now this is the lesson where I inadvertently put some questions on the last assignment. You'll see uh, you'll see the techniques that would have been required for those questions. So if you're able to do those questions on the assignment, uh, that's a great job and this will basically reinforce maybe some of the techniques you used. Um, so you will be getting questions on this week's assignment uh, related to this. They will be different questions um, but uh, similar types of strategies and techniques used. So anyways, uh, so we're looking at the properties of limits and if you remember uh, limit of a function it's the value that the function approaches from both the left and right side um, of a specific value. Um, now, uh, important thing here: if the function if the function is a polynomial function, then the limit of that function at any value of x is always just the value of that function of x. So basically, you can you know that if you've got um, any kind of polynomial, it could be uh, any degree, it could be linear, quadratic, or higher. Um, you could pick any point along here, and you could see that if you approach it from the left or right, it doesn't, It's they're both approaching the same point, which is the value of the function at that point. So the limits for a polynomial function, very easy, just plug the value in, you, that's the limit, okay? You don't have to worry about, well, but if they don't agree from both the left and right side, they will always agree, okay? Now, for other types of functions, it's not so straightforward sometimes. Sometimes when you, um, if you, if you substituted the value of where you want to find the limit into the function, you, a lot of times, if you remember from those questions, a lot of times you get zero over zero or something over zero the indeterminate form, which, you know, basically that's something you can't have. So don't um, don't take the easy way out saying uh, the limits doesn't exist because it still can exist. In most cases, it, w it will exist. You just have to apply a few techniques to find it. So um, what we're going to do is uh, s learn those techniques. Um, now, the technique I talked about where you just plug in the value into the function to get the limit. That's called direct substitution. So that always works with polynomials. It also works a lot of the time with other functions too. But uh, when that does not work, when you get something over zero, that means you should consider one of these four techniques. Um, the first two, you've, you know, you've already done these factoring. Uh, you know, break it down into factors and uh, maybe you can cancel a factor on the top and bottom, and it will become a non um, non indeterminate, and you can plug it in, plug the value in at that point, and you get a a limit that works. Okay, rationalizing could be the numerator denominator. We've worked on that. One sided limits. We'll look at that. That's uh, more uh, to do with any function that might have absolute value involved and change of variable. So that's the this is the rarest of the techniques, um, but I'll show you how to do that. Okay, um, we're also going to be looking at uh, properties. That's the main title, although the main content of this lesson is strategies for finding limits. Um, so this basically says find the limit of this polynomial. Well, we've kind of already determined for polynomials. It's just the same as plugging in the value, but let's just pretend we didn't know that at this point. Um, so I could take these three terms in the polynomial separately and just find each of those limits as x approaches 2. Um, so in this case I would get uh, 3 times 4, that's 12. 4 times 2 is 8, and that does not get affected by x. So if I evaluated that, add them together, I would get 19, and that is in fact uh, the value of that limit. If you graphed it, you'd see the same thing. This is also the same as, um, well, we don't have a name for this function. If it was if it was f, we would say this is the same as f of 2. 
um, because the limit is the actual value of the function at that point. Okay, um, so that should be pretty self-explanatory. Um, let's look at the properties. Most of these will be fairly obvious, but uh, maybe something we can take advantage of if it wasn't. Okay, um, so if I take the limit of k, um, k is any constant, and x is uh, the the variable x is approaching another value. Well, there's no x in here at all. So basically, if you're taking the limit of a constant, so say the function was uh, f of x equals 2, well, the limit anywhere along there is going to be 2, okay? Because it's not, you know, the value everywhere is going to be 2. So that's pretty obvious. Uh, if it's just a single, like a linear function here, limit of x as x approaches a, this, this would be considered linear polynomial. So the limit is a, you just plug it in. Now when you have something a little more complicated, say you had two separate functions and you had you wanted to add those functions together and find the limit, that's simply the same as finding the limit of each separate function and either adding to adding or subtracting, depending on what that was, uh, adding or subtracting the limits together. Okay? Um, if you had a constant multiplier in front of the function, you want to find the limit as x approaches a, you can bring that constant out front of the limit and just turn that into, it's going to be c times the limit of f of x as x approaches a. Um, it's just bringing the constant outside. If you have two functions that are multiplying the product of these two, you want to find their limit. You could, you could if you wanted to, you could, you could multiply them together and, and work it that way, or you could just find the, in, the separate limits of f of x and g of x as x approaches a, multiply those two limit results together. Okay, same thing with dividing. Um, if you have quotient, it's like quotient here. Um, so if you're trying to find the limit as x approaches a of these this function over this function, you could do the two separate limits and divide them, but of course you have to be careful what happens if the limit of the denominator function was zero, so you have to put that as a disclaimer or a constraint. Um, and then this one might not be obvious, um, but it might be something we could also use. If you had uh, a function, the whole function to a power an exponent, um, and you want to find the limit of that as x approaches a, uh, you could actually just find the limit of f of x as x approaches a, and then apply the uh, apply the exponent to the result of the limit. So that may not be totally obvious, but it uh, it makes sense once you hear it. Okay, so uh, on the next page, we're just gonna practice using the limit properties. Just to, now when you, if I gave you questions like this to do on an assignment, um, wouldn't really ask you if I just say uh, find the limit, you, you would do it the very quick way and just plug it in or use one of the techniques we're going to learn later. Um, but this one says, all three of them actually say, uh, use the limit properties. So we'll have to break it down. Sorry, I guess you can't see that. We're going to break this down into parts of the function and, and solve it that way. So do you remember uh, if we looked at this? Let me get back to the right page. If we looked at where we're adding together two functions, well, you know, this could be x squared, this could be 3x, right? So you could have a multi-term polynomial. So what we can do for this is take separate limits. So the limit of, the limit as x approaches 2 of 3x squared plus then we take the limit of the second term, limit of uh, 4x, so that plus comes from that plus there, as x approaches 2, of course, and then finally the limit as x approaches 2 of negative 1. Actually, since it's minus 1 there, we would put, we would subtract that limit and just keep this. Okay, um, and then you take each one separately. Now this one you could even break down farther, further. You could uh, bring the 3 out. You could say 3 times the limit of x approaches 2 of x squared. Um, 
I'm just I'm just going to break it down by term. Uh, later on, you'll see how we break it down using another um, another technique. So uh, if I plug in x, you know, plug in two for x here, I'm going to get. Um, well, actually, you know what? Let's let's bring that out. That's not that much extra work. So we're going to bring the three out front. So it's going to be three times the limit. Uh, x approaches two of x squared. Uh, we could do the same thing here. We could bring the four out front plus four times the limit. I'll put a dot there to emphasize that. Limit of x because the four is now out front as x approaches two. And then this one, we don't have to do anything. It's already broken down. Limit as x approaches two of one. If you want to put it in brackets, that's fine. Okay, now we we can substitute in. We could have actually substituted this one in right away. I just wanted to leave it kind of at the same stage. Uh, so if I plug in x equal to there, that's going to become the limit will approach 4. And so that's going to be 3 times the limit, which is 3 times 4. Okay, and then we have plus 4 times the limit as x approaches 2. For x, well, that's just 2. And then this would be as x approaches 2, it doesn't really do anything. It's, this will be 1. The limit of this will always be 1. So we're subtracting that. So we get, uh, uh, that's going to be 12 plus 8 minus 1, which is 19. Now, that may seem familiar. We did that as our example 1 earlier on, where we just kind of substituted in. But now you can see as how we can uh, use the prop limit properties to break this down into easier looking limits. Okay, now this one here, uh, I'm going to st still use the limit properties to evaluate this rational function limit. Um, so remember, if you're taking the limit of a rational function, we can break that down into the limit of the numerator over the limit of the denominator, so that's what we'll do. Um, so that's going to be limit as x approaches negative 1, of x squared minus 5x plus 2, over the limit as x approaches 1 of 2x cubed plus 3x plus 1. Okay, and you know, we could go farther like we did with these, uh, this polynomial function. We could break this down into three separate limits, three separate limits. Um, I don't think we have to do that for this. I just wanted to show this this uh, dividing uh, property for limits. So now we can just plug in negative 1 into the top. So we get negative 1 squared. We can plug in negative 1 here. We get negative 5 times negative 1 plus 2. Do the same thing down here. That should be negative. So 2 times negative 1 cubed plus 3 times negative 1 plus 1. Um, that will equal 8, so that's a negative 1 plus 5, sorry, that's 1 plus 5 plus 2, that's 8. This will be negative 2 minus 3 plus 1, that's going to be negative 4. So the entire limit is just going to be equal to negative 2. Okay, let's try this guy here. Uh, this one's, it's a rational Looks like it's a rational function, but we've got the square root on the outside. So uh, it's kind of a hybrid of a radical and a, and a rational function at the same time. So the first thing I can do is, um, if you think about it, that square root sign is really just an exponent of negative, sorry, of one half. So you can treat the radicals like it's an exponent. So I'm just going to take that square root outside the whole limit and then I'm going to take the limit as x approaches 5 of uh, x squared over x minus 1. So this basically means we're just going to take the limit of the rational function first, find that limit and then take the square root of the limit. Uh, we can take this a little bit farther uh, just like we did on the last one. So we'll take the limit of each of these two separately, but still keep the square root on the outer side of the whole 
calculation. So limit as x approaches 5 of x squared over limit x approaches 5 of x minus 1. And now you can see these are limits that we're used to doing. We'll do those first and then divide and then take the square root. So when I take that I get um, uh, 25 over here that would be 5 minus 1 is 4. Okay now 25 and 4 are perfect squares. Take the square root we get 5 halves or 2.5. So that's how you would use the limit properties to take something fairly complex looking and turn it into something very simple. Okay. Now, we, like I said, we could have just plugged in, first just plugged in the values because that's, in effect, that's what we did in the end. Um, but this is using limit properties to evaluate. So this is where I'd want to at least see a couple of, you know, couple of breakdowns that you could get to that point. You, Like I said, you could go a little bit farther and even break this one down. Uh, the limit of x minus the limit of 1. But um, this is showing two very important steps. Taking the square root outside and then separating the rational function into two separate limits. Okay, so that's how you would use limit properties uh, to evaluate limits. So you're looking for those keywords. That's when you know you'd have to do this. If it's just evaluate the limit, I don't expect you show this, show these properties. You could definitely use them, of course, but uh, that uh, that's a key to to say you've got to break it down rather than just substitute. Okay, so now we're going to get into some strategies of. I don't have to break it down into the properties, but we're going to use techniques because on these ones, you're going to see that the substitution, direct substitution, does not work. Um, so, for example, this one here, as x approaches 3, we're going to find the limit as x approaches 3. Um, and you can very quickly see if you plug in 3, you're going to get divide by 0 error. Um, that doesn't mean the limit doesn't exist. That just means we got to we got to work a bit harder to get it. So... When you see something like this, your first first reaction should be, hey, maybe I could factor the top, and hopefully one of those factors is x minus 3, and that's always a good safe, safe assumption, because just about every time you get this, it will be a, the same factor as the one below. That also helps in your factoring quite a bit, because then you, you, know, you have a pretty good idea that one of these factors on the top is x minus 3. So, you know, you could almost uh, assume it is and then see, well, what would the other factor be? Well, that should be x plus 1. And then just, uh, that's just to get the minus, sorry, just to get the minus 3 here. Um, and then, of course, we'll check to make sure. So that's going to be a minus 3 plus, plus 1. So that's that works out. And you can see, like we expected, these two factors cancel. So in reality, this limit becomes, so this part doesn't change, but the function we're taking the limit for it does, uh, it's going to be the limit of x plus 1. So at this point now you can, you can do a direct substitution for x, and that's going to be 4. 3 plus 1. So that's how you get that limit. Now if you graph this, <coughs> If you used Desmos and you did this graph, you could you could see, well, where's this function? Uh, what's the value of this function as we approach x equals 3 from both sides? And you'll see that it is 4. So obviously this is a lot quicker than doing a graph, but you can use the graph to check if you're not sure. Okay. Um, this one here, um, and it almost tells you <laughs> which strategy to use. Select a, select a rationalizing strategy, okay? So you can see a radical on the top, so can't do much about the bottom in terms of uh, rationalizing it because you don't have anything to work with, really. But you can see if you did direct substitution again here, you're going to get divide by zero. So what we will do, take the limit as x approaches zero. Okay, so I'm going to just start off I'll begin with what we had here, square root of x plus 1 minus 1 over x. 
And we're going to multiply that by the conjugate of the numerator. So in effect, we're rationalizing the numerator. So hopefully you guys are good at this. So it's basically, you know, that's the first term, that's the second term. So we keep those terms the same, but we change the sign in between them. Okay, and so that's going to fix the top. Um, and of course we have to multiply by the same thing on the denominator. Uh, and the reason that that's true is this whole thing is just multiplying by one. So you're not changing the value of the limit. You're just uh, changing the way it's represented. Okay, so now, okay, so when you do, this is like a difference of squares, a minus b times a plus b. So you're gonna get this thing squared minus this thing squared. So when you square anything that's square rooted, you just get the original thing. So that's gonna be x plus one. And then we subtract whatever that is squared. So that's subtract another one. And then on the bottom, I'm gonna get x times, put this whole thing in brackets, of course. Now, don't, uh, don't distribute that yet. Remember this when we did this at the beginning of the unit. Um, you can probably see already, you know, that you're gonna to wanna to cancel that x. So why make it more complicated by distributing and then have to factor it again out? So, um, so this plus and minus one, they're gone. And all you're left with is an x on the top. Okay, and that x, this is basically x by itself now. So you're not canceling, yeah, so you're just, uh, you have an x there and x there, divide, cancel those factors out. You're left with a one. Okay, so that's gonna be, just to simplify the way this looks, uh, that's gonna simplify to uh, one over square root of x plus one plus one. And you can see now, if you do a direct substitution, uh, it won't create the problem. Uh, because that turns into uh, square root of 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. So problem gone by doing the rationalizing the numerator. So hopefully you remember this from earlier in the unit. This is where we're using it. Okay, uh, this one is the rare one. It's a little bit tricky. So, so what we're going to do, the substitution strategy is we're going to introduce a new variable um, that's going to make this a little bit easier to work with, okay? So, we've got, um, you know, x plus 1 uh, to the 1 third, which is basically cube root, minus 2 over x. As x approaches, uh, not sure why that says negative, but 0. Um, so if you plugged in 0 there, obviously you get a problem. So, what the substitution will be, um, this is to kind of avoid working with this cube root, that's gonna make it really complicated. If we try to do something like, um, if we did uh, you know, the previous strategy, rationalize the numerator, it's gonna be really challenging, if not impossible. So what we do is, we, I'm gonna introduce new variable u, and I'm gonna let that represent this whole thing, this whole, quote, first term here. So u is equal to x plus eight cube root. So now I can do something, here's the trick to this. If I cube both sides, I'm gonna get uh, u cubed is equal to, and the cubing will just cancel that. So u cubed equals x plus eight. So therefore I can uh, isolate for x. So x is actually gonna be equal to u cubed minus eight. Um, now, if you if you go back, because now we're using, we've got this u. So how does how does this limit get changed into a limit from u? So, so basically, we know as x is approaching zero for this limit. So what happens as x approaches zero? Well, if that's a zero, well that has to be an eight, and the only number you could put here that would work would be uh, would be two. So you basically, you're sort of solving 
for you here, but these two things are equivalent. These two, um, you know, as x approaches zero, u approaches two, based on our definition here. So what we're going to do now is rewrite this whole limit. Okay, so now instead of x approaches zero, we're saying x approach, sorry, u approaches two. All right, so uh, this x plus eight to the power one third, that's, that's equal to u. So on the top here, we just have u minus two. And on the bottom, we, we isolated for x, so we're going to change x into u cubed minus 8. Okay, so that's a little bit nicer to work with because you don't have the 1 third. Um, but what should we do here? So if you remember your um, difference of cube factoring, that's exactly what we have to do here. It could also, you know, it could have a similar question with uh, sum of cubes. So basically, I'm not going to show you how to do that, but it's not hard to look it up on the internet um, or remember from your advanced functions course. So if I factor that, I'll put this top in brackets, u minus 2. I could factor that because that's basically u cubed minus 2 cubed. So the two factors you get from that are u minus 2 and you can see why this is going to work right away. And what's left over, following the formula, it's going to be u squared plus 2u plus 4. The 4 comes from the 2 squared. Okay, so you can see very easily these two are going to cancel. I'm going to be left with a 1 up there. So if I just rewrite that limit as u approaches 2, a 1 over u squared plus 2u plus 4. Okay, so what happens if I plug in a 2 here? Well, you can see that's going to be a 4, that's going to be a 4, and that's going to be a 4. Um, so this whole limit is going to be equal to 1 12th. And uh, that strategy is called the substitution strategy. So um, you're going to see something similar to this, where you're going to, you know, something to a, you know, a rational could be one half, could be one to the fourth, maybe, probably not one to the fourth, but a lot of times it's to the one third, and that allows you to do the difference or sum of cubes factoring here. So this this can be a kind of a template for the for this uh, type of solution. If you see another one like it, okay, last page. So this is the one, if you go back to the very first page, when we talked about talked about the different techniques or strategies, okay, this is the one that we just try first all the time, and if it doesn't work, we try one of these. So you've seen factoring, you've seen rationalizing, what, uh, you've seen change of variable, that's the last one we did. So the one-sided limit, that's what we're going to kind of look at now. And that's almost always when you have um, an absolute value function because these totally change uh, you know the way they behave on, uh, depending on whether the value inside of the absolute value is negative or positive so so it says find this limit illustrate with a graph okay um, so I'm going to explain it from both perspectives so I'm going to do the algebra solution. And the way we do this, uh, we do two different one-sided limits. So you can see the value of this function changes um, when x is greater than 2 or x is less than 2. Uh, so once this becomes positive, if this is positive, um, you'll have one one function, and if it's if this whole thing is negative, you have a totally different looking function. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do is just make this into a function called f of x. So absolute value of x minus two over x minus two. Okay, so hopefully you can follow this part here. So 
if x is greater than 2, this absolute value function doesn't really come into play. Um, it's just we could basically remove them without having the impact because absolute value function only gets invoked when you've got uh, a negative value inside. So um, if x is negative two, uh, x is greater than 2, the function just becomes x minus 2 over x minus 2 because the absolute value functions do not get do not get used but that's only when x is bigger than 2 what happens when x is less than 2 well if x is less than 2 this whole thing would be negative and then we'd have to change it to positive because that's what absolute value would do so it's kind of like whatever that is whatever x minus 2 is we ch switch the sign so it looks like this so in this case this value x minus 2 will always be negative so we have to change it to positive by putting the negative sign in front okay um, now what we do is we take these two one-sided limits so this is the point where everything changes we want to see if this limit actually does exist to see if it's the same from both sides we didn't have to do that before with the other functions but this one we do okay so if we looked at the limit as x approaches 2 from the negative side of, and I'm going to use the original function here, absolute value of x minus 2 over x minus 2. So that's the case. It's approaching from the negative side. So that's going to be this one here. So if this is the case, you know, I could put brackets around here and you could easily see um, these two cancel each other out, so I've got negative 1 over 1. Okay, so that limit is actually negative 1. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, now if I look from the other side, the limit as x approaches 2 from the positive side of the same function. Okay, in this case, if we go back, so this is the situation now. Uh, x is coming from the positive side, so we're going to be using this. Well, these two are the same. These just basically cancel out. You got one over one, so the limit here is one. And you can see these two limits are not the same. They don't match. So the conclusion would be, therefore, the limit. Now, this is where you do from both sides. Limit as x approaches two of x minus two absolute value over x minus two does not exist. DNE. Okay. Now, from a graph, a graphic perspective, uh, graphing perspective, um, we we'll go back to this. Now, you can see, you know, the, the important point here would be at two. Okay. So when x is greater than two, that's the function, and we just saw, you know, these two things cancel out. So if that's one, um, and this is only greater than two, not equal to two. So that part of the function as x is approaching from the, as x is greater than 2, you can see the function is always, you know, f of x is always equal to 1, okay? If we do it from the other side, you can see that, like we've already seen the limit here, it's approaching negative, it's always going to be the value of negative 1. So you'd basically have, a line going to the left at uh, negative one. So um, visually you can see these two limits as you're approaching two don't approach the same value. So that's how you would show that uh, graph uh, visually. Okay, um, last question here. This one's a little bit, uh, a little bit trickier, but uh, this could be like a thinking question maybe. Uh, Evaluate the limit as x approaches 3 from the negative side uh, of square root of 9 minus x squared. So this basically says that you know 3 is always going to be below um, below 3. Sorry, x is always going to be below 3. So what is that limit? So limit as x approaches 3 from the negative side of 9 minus x squared.
Um, okay, um, before I put this answer here, the answer is zero because that x gets pro closer and closer to three from the negative side. This, um, whatever's under the radical, it's always going to be zero or positive, so you don't have the issue of being negative overall. Um, but as it's getting closer and closer to th three, this whole thing is getting closer to zero, so the whole limit is equal to zero. Okay, so I want to show you from a slightly different, uh, so if I, if I came up with this new equation for this, uh, if I said y equals equal to nine minus x squared. Okay, so let's kind of come up with a new version of this. So if I square both sides, I get y squared equals, square this, uh, cancels the square root sign. I get nine minus x squared. Okay, and you can see I could actually add x squared to both sides. I get x squared plus y squared equals nine. And if you remember, that is a circle of radius three centered at the origin. Um, now, since it is a function, you get into tricky territory. Um, I can't really draw the whole circle um, because then it wouldn't be a function anymore. So we'll just leave it like that. That's what the graph would look like. Okay. So you can see as we're approaching this uh, from the left side of three, you can see it a little more visually here, you're approaching y equals zero. So remember looking at the y value as we're approaching three uh, from the left side, we're approaching y equals zero. So that's where that limit comes from. Second question, explain why the limit as x approaches three from the positive side cannot be determined. So uh, that's what this is where the graph really becomes in handy because if you're approaching three from the positive side, it means you're coming from this direction and you can't come from this direction uh, because uh, for any value of x bigger than three, you, uh, this function's undefined, okay? Because you'd have a negative square root of a negative number. So function is undefined or is not defined for x greater than 3. Okay, and basically what that means is the limit, therefore the limit as x approaches 3 from the positive side of this original function, 9 minus x squared, uh, does not exist. So that limit does not exist. This limit from the left side does exist and it's zero. So um, now we get to the third question. You can kind of see where we're going here. Now, what can you conclude about the limit as x approaches three? This is from both sides of uh, square root of nine minus x squared. Well, this would be where you compare the two one-sided limits. So one side we get zero, the other side does not exist. And if they don't match up, or they both don't exist, then you can conclude um, that the, the overall limit does not exist. So since there is no limit on the right side, the limit as x approaches three, and that's, that's both sides uh, of nine minus x squared does not exist. Okay, so when you see it visually like that, it's, uh, it's a little more obvious that uh, you have no, the function does not exist outside greater than three, less than negative three, so you can't possibly have a limit for either of these two points, okay? So that's, uh, that's it for this lesson. Hopefully you've learned some new techniques that will help you in uh, calculating limits. And uh, when we do the next assignment later this week, you will have some similar questions to you.
to what you had on the previous assignment that I told you you didn't have to do. So um, those those would be good practice for you. If you go back and try to redo those now and you should be pretty good for the next assignment for that. Okay, um, so like I said earlier, this uh, last lesson I think, uh, this Friday's assignment will be primarily the last, well, today's lesson, the lesson that the next lesson and the previous one. So the two limit, two lessons on limits, and the one last lesson on continuity. That will that will be most of the test, but you will still have, not test uh, most of the assignment, but you will still have to have knowledge from the first few lessons. You, you can't avoid that, but the uh, majority of the questions will be um, restricted to the. You know the, the three lessons we're doing this week okay don't forget uh, we have another session on Thursday if you want to get some extra help um, I'm a little underwhelmed by how many people are using this so that's either a good sign or a bad sign I'm hoping it means that you're getting this and you don't need extra help but uh, I'm a bit of a realist I think there's some people that uh, maybe should be doing a bit more work before we get to uh, the, the assignment, okay? Want to see you guys do well in this course for for university next year, if that's where you're headed. I uh, don't, you know, I, I don't want you to uh, be taking calculus next year and thinking, oh, I, I guess I should have done a little bit more work in high school calculus. So it definitely will help you, so. All right, uh, so good luck with the work, and uh, there'll be one more lesson that will be uh, loaded up uh, Thursday night this week, and then Friday afternoon will be the next assignment. Okay, thanks. Have a great day.